Hi, it's Jill Schlesinger. On this episode of Jill on Money, how can you show the best part of yourself? There's so many different dimensions to ourselves, including our flaws and our weaknesses. Just like a diamond, there's some angles in which you're going to shine really brightly. There's other angles in which you're not going to shine as brightly or you're going to have some flaws. And part of it is understanding in which context, under what lighting, under what environments, in front of which people. What angles do you want to be showing to shine the brightest? Welcome to the Jill on Money podcast. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. You know, when I saw that someone from Harvard Business School wrote a book, I'm like, whatever, who cares? Another person from Harvard Business School writing a book, right? But I got a star for you. This one is good. Laura Huang, she used to be at Wharton. She kind of jumped the ship, goes to Harvard, and she wrote a really interesting book called Edge, Turning Adversity into Advantage. Laura does something really interesting. She tries to figure out how to find a competitive edge when you feel like all the stakes are against you. So I hope you enjoy this. I certainly did. If you like this interview, don't forget, give us a rating or write a review. You can do that anywhere you get your podcast. And while you're at it, you might as well just do it now. Subscribe. Then you won't miss a single episode. Okay, here's our interview with Laura Huang. You're listening to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. We start with a very simple question. You ready? Mm -hmm. What is the best career or money decision you've ever made? Wow, that is a great question. Um, Probably the instances where I've leapt before thinking. I know that sounds um, wrong in some ways, but there are instances in which I was offered something and I sort of didn't think and just took it, but then I've made it work out. And those have been some of the most rewarding and best career decisions. All right. So you're very young and you're a Harvard Business School professor. Tell us a little bit of the story of your life. Where'd you come from? Yeah. So I'm Taiwanese American. So I'm dual Taiwan U.S. citizenship and grew up in New Jersey, painfully shy as a child and ended up doing engineering in college. Found out that I was pretty bad uh, at engineering, got pulled into um, the business side of things, technical marketing, worked in investment banking, consulting, and finally now I'm a professor. So I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. What's it like to be like Harvard Business School professor? <laughs> Sounds very impressive to someone like me who oh. does not have an MBA, uh, maybe an MBA wannabe. But is it a rarefied environment? How do you feel about that? It's an amazing environment, but, you know, it's also it's it's. It's a normal environment in lots of different ways. I actually have gotten rejected from Harvard multiple times. I applied to get my MBA at Harvard and was rejected. <gasps> I applied for a PhD at Harvard and was rejected. Wait so a minute, where'd also, you get your MBA? My MBA was at INSEAD, which oh, was in, in Paris. Fran- yes, ah. in France and in Singapore. And then um, my PhD was at UC Irvine. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's it's a little bit of actually the first time I ever stepped foot on Harvard soil was when um, they invited me to do a research talk, which then led to the job offer. So I had actually not even been to the campus up until the point at which I almost was was working there. And so when did you start working there? Uh, January of 2018. So are you tenure track I is am tenure track. So which before, means how long? So uh, so I'm an associate professor, which typically at most schools is a tenured position. HBS is one of the only schools that doesn't tenure until you are at the full professor level. So before I was at Harvard, I was at the Wharton School. I've heard of and, that at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> yes. yes. So I was there for almost seven years and I was there um, as an assistant professor. And that was actually my first academic job. Why'd you leave Penn? Yeah, I mean, honestly, there are, there's just so many people there that I adore, that I miss dearly um, on a daily basis. This was one of those leap and then think kind of decisions Mm. that I, that I talked about. Um, I had not intended to leave Penn at all, came to do that research talk that I, that I spoke about at HBS, where they just invited me to present my research, do a brown bag. And after that, they called me a couple of weeks later, they called me and they said, hey, would you be interested in moving? And I said, moving where? <laughs> and they said, moving 
here? And I said, no, no, I'm actually, you know, we're settled in Philadelphia. We're really happy. There's a we, so there's a partner. Yeah, yeah, okay. partner, kids, the whole shebang. Everything's, we're good, we're good. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and then a couple weeks later, they called again and they said, what would it take to get you to move? Did you put a big um, number out? Well, I was, I mean, I kind of was, you know, I even said something along the lines of, I probably shouldn't have said this to to the department chair, but I said something like, you do realize you've, you, you've rejected me multiple times. Like, I'm not sloppy seconds here. I, I don't know if I was thinking that or if I said that out loud. I love that. It was something along those lines. Um, and, you know, but I, but I also at that moment was like, wow, they're really serious about this. And he said to me, the department chair said to me, well, you know, why don't you come? Why don't, why don't you come visit us? And what was Spend your, the day with us. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. What was the brown bag presentation of research? What was the research? I was presenting on my, on gut feel and investors. So how in, angel investors use their gut feel to invest in startup companies. So what, that was really based on my, some of my dissertation early research where I realized that um, a a lot of the decisions that people make, even though they're very analytical in nature, that in fact they're driven by people's intuition, and we really use that gut feel to make sense of that hard data. In in your analysis, did you find that gut feel worked or didn't work? Yeah, so it's interesting. What I found was that gut feel doesn't work when you're just looking at the aggregate. So if you talk, if you're thinking in terms of baseball averages, right, you're not going to you know be be batting 400 or batting 500. But what your gut feel allows you to do is pinpoint the home runs. It allows you to know which investments are going to be absolute dogs and which ones are going to be absolute home runs. And so for angel investors who are investing on this portfolio approach where really they don't care if 20 or so are absolute losses, but one's a 30x return, it actually works in their in their benefit. And what happens is that when we don't use our gut feel in these types of high uncertainty, high complexity decisions, we sometimes talk ourselves out of it by finding the data to justify what we really wanted to do anyways. And so that was sort of the power of, of gut feel for a lot of these these investors. This is a, a very like a sort of back to my sports roots. You know, there are some people who are natural athletes. And so I, I can teach somebody how to shoot a layup. Mm-hmm. I can sh- teach someone the mechanics behind a beautiful foul shot. But I can't teach someone to be a great basketball player. Mm -hmm. So tell me about how you approach leadership. Yeah, I mean, it was a question, to be honest, that I also asked myself. I was sort of even something like entrepreneurship. Can you teach entrepreneurship? Can you teach leadership? So the short answer is yes, because because my business card says professor of entrepreneurship and professor. Ergo, I agree. You are an expert. Um, That's right. Um, But, you know, the thing is, it's very much about building these these schemas and these patterns and these mental models. That's really where I think the power of learning and teaching something like leadership and entrepreneurship really exists. It's about this awareness of your own strengths and weaknesses, the types of organizations that you're going to be most optimally a leader for, instances where what is the band at which you can operate, where you can be successful or not successful, or brute force it or not. And it's putting yourselves in these situations so that you, in a sense, gain your own intuition, mm. that you don't go in with, with a situational type of arrogance because you think you've seen it and now you're going to import it into a different industry. It's about being able to sort of build these these mental models and and going in and sort of acting and reacting and also leading in a way where you think it's intuitive, but it's really based on scenarios that you've talked about and things in the classroom that we've discussed. That's really the power of of the classroom, I think, for for this. And that's why I think the classroom setting is still so important to be able to learn and listen from from others. All right, let's talk about the book. Yeah. Because I really liked it. I even said to Mark, I'm like, uh, uh, I didn't read that other person's book because I had to read Laura's. Uh, <laughs> so, all right, let's just first define edge, which mm-hmm. you say <clears throat> edge is about knowing how, when, and where to put in the effort and hard work. That seems like easy to do, but actually it's really hard. 
So can you talk a little bit about identifying edge and, yeah. and how you know when to put that effort into the edge? Absolutely. I mean, this is something that is very hard, but at first glance, it seems like something very easy. So people are, always, oh, you wrote this book. What are the 10 steps that I need to do to gain my edge? <laughs> and the thing is, what this really is, is a perspective. It's a perspective on what it means to have an edge. And the more that you make it authentically about you and your strengths and your weaknesses and who you are, the better your ability to actually create and gain that edge for yourself. The premise of it is that we're sort of taught from a really young age that it's about hard work, right? That if you want to be successful and you want to get the right outcomes, put in the hard work, right? You ask super successful people how they made it, and inevitably, hard work will be one of the things that they yeah, say. Yeah, and you know what they always leave out? Good luck. Yeah. Luck is luck good, is, too. Exactly. Luck is a huge portion of it. But luck is also things, what we th- we see as luck is also other people having given you opportunities or having some sort of a privileged background or luck can be a lot of different things. You know, when we talk about hard work, hard work doesn't speak for itself. It sometimes does, but in most instances, hard work doesn't speak for itself. What do you think about this 10,000 hour thing? So I think that hard work is critical And, you know, I think that it's a great way for us to see hard work as something that is very critical. But in my book, I talk about how hard work is something that we talk about first. But in fact, hard work should come last. Because once you understand some of these principles, that's when your hard work works harder for you. And that's where that 10,000 hours of practice ends up making that difference because you already get that the world is dominated by perceptions and attributions and that you have the ability to guide those perceptions and attributions so that your 10,000 hours and your hard work will work harder for you. What amazed me is that when you started that, you said you, you know, you sort of, it it requires a pretty brutally honest Mm self-assessment, right? Totally. You started talking about your story, your, your origin story, and you said, I was a bad engineering student, right? Yeah. So you could have gritted through, you could have put in all the hard work necessary. What was it about that, that you could see you weren't going to be a good engineer. I mean, I gritted it through college in the sense that I started it and I was going to finish with that degree. My dad had given me this piece of advice because I had said, you know, I want to I want to I want to switch majors. And I this was really early on and I said I want to switch majors. I don't like this. And he said he said to me, "You you can absolutely switch majors, but you can't switch unless you know what it is you're switching into." and that you're going to like it more than what you're currently in. It really was sort of one of those things where I was like, okay, I could be doing economics. But then I was like, I would take an economics class and then I would, I, you know, I was sort of like, yeah, I don't know if I would like this more. Or I would take something else. And I, so I kept pursuing and I just, I think it was one of those, I just didn't know what I wanted to do at that point. Mm. And so I just kind of kept going until I finished. And like I said, I still, to some extent, don't know what I want to do. I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And some of the most interesting people that I've met are people who have had multiple different careers or have acknowledged that they, they're not the type of people who are like, I have wanted to be a biologist since I was five years old and now I'll be a biologist. I mean, those are interesting to people too, but it just means that there's lots of different trajectories. Absolutely. So I love this part of uh, your second chapter. I'm not giving the whole book away. People got to buy the book. (laughs) Again, the book is called Edge. Your basic goods, kind of like taking your inventory, right? You say that there are two components, essentially, which is you bring value, you enrich what would otherwise be. Second, others think so too. And what I love about this is this nuance where you say you've got to put an and. That's really the the very important aspect of this. Like, yeah, you bring value, but if nobody knows you bring value, that's great for you to know, yep. but who cares? So talk about how you came up with these two components and how you linked them. That's right. I mean, the, the question is, is there an or between those two statements or is there an and between those two statements? Because the, the first part of it is knowing how you enrich and provide value. The second part of that is that other people think you enrich and provide value. And there's a lot of people who that you have that or. They only have that second piece. They're really great at managing impressions. They're really great at other people believing that they bring, that they bring value and that they enrich when they might not. 
that's really frustrating for a lot of us, especially when we're trying to to do both. And it makes a lot of us start to think, We don't want to be that person. Mm. We don't want to be managing the impressions of others. We don't want to be strategic and manipulative in that way when we're pretending that we're somebody that we're not. And this actually prevents a lot of people from gaining their edge because they don't want to position themselves in a way that is authentically them because they're mixing up the fact that guiding and managing people's perceptions can be something that's really authentic. People are going to have a first impression of you, whether or not you give them one or Mm. not. And so it's actually much more, it's the opposite of being strategic. It's much more authentic when you guide them to who you actually are. So that first impression is in line with that value you provide so that you can have that richer, deeper interpersonal relationship with the person that you're, you're engaging with. Do you think this is at all gendered? Because I don't want to, you know, maybe I'm speaking from an older generation than you, but Often when I have given that kind of advice, well, you know, does anyone know that you can do that? Mm-hmm. Oftentimes I'll get a pushback, often from women who are my, my mm-hmm. age, who are uncomfortable with that. Mm-hmm. It, it, did you find any gender difference? Yeah, I mean, there's absolutely a gender component to that, but there's also this component of everyone has something. And we all go into situations and regardless of who we are, people have are making perceptions and attributions about us. Part of what women in in particular face is this double bind where on the one hand, we are expected to seem warm and communal and social. And on the other hand, we want to portray ourselves as competent, capable people. And those two don't always match. And so we're constantly tiptoeing between those Mm. two and trying to show that we can be capable and that we're that we are very competent, but that we also are allowed to be warm. Whereas I feel, you know, we we see that that there are some groups, you know, where, for example, men get an extra boost. They're automatically given the benefit of the doubt in looking capable and seeming capable, but then they get this extra boost when they are warm. Um, oh, that's so interesting. Because I was thinking about it like a slightly opposite way, which is that, you know, the assertive man is a strong leader and the assertive woman is a bitch. Yes. Right? Yes. But I didn't, I understand that when you say that, like, if you get a guy, and I've had this where we've had, we just had the founders of Warby Parker in uh-huh. here. There was like- Hello, a, Neil. The, hello, <laughs> Neil. And there, were, there was like a gentleness to them that was so lovely. And I think I gave them a boost because I was like, oh, they're not asshole billionaires. Like, they were so- mortified and embarrassed when I say, how does it feel to be a billionaire on paper? Yeah. And they like turn bright red. Yeah. And I think that 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 was very charming to me. Yeah. So assertive, aggressive men are rated higher than assertive, aggressive women, but assertive, aggressive men who also can show a little bit of warmth or vulnerability, get even that extra boost on top of that. Now, let us now move on a little bit. You also say Knowing your strengths is great. Tell me about how owning your weakness can really change it. I mean, we all have this highlight reel, right? And we all are sort of presenting this highlight reel of ourselves to to other people. But when you really are able to guide and delight others is when you're able to also acknowledge and understand your own weaknesses. There are instances in which you might double down on your strengths and not think about your weaknesses at all. There are other instances where you might want to be working on your weaknesses and make them, you know, elevate them. And there's others where you just want your weaknesses to not be liabilities. Those are really different contexts and in different industries and in different situations. We need to understand how we're sort of being viewed. Um, I use this analogy as well, how people are like diamonds and each person, when we say be yourself, it's such it's really kind of bad advice because there's so many different dimensions to ourselves, including our flaws and our weaknesses. Just like a diamond, there's some angles in which you're going to shine really brightly. There's other angles in which you're not going to shine as brightly or you're going to have some flaws. And part of it is understanding in which contexts, under what lighting, under what environments, in front of which people, what angles do you want to be showing to shine the brightest, but also understanding understanding that behind it, you're still the same diamond. This is Jill on Money. Hey, gang, it's Jill. 
Jill Schlesinger, certified financial planner, CBS News business analyst, and host of this podcast. So exciting. I'm here to tell you about our sponsor, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Marcus is part of a storied company that's been a leader in financial services for generations. Marcus offers simple, secure access to FDIC-insured savings products, including a high-yield online savings account that earns four times the national average. Marcus also offers certificates of deposit, including no penalty CDs. Want to find out how much interest your savings could earn with Marcus? Head to Marcus.com and try their high-yield savings calculator to compare rates from other banks. It takes just a few minutes. National average data provided by Informa and accuracy cannot be guaranteed. Marcus Deposits products are provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. And now back to our interview with Laura Huang. You said, you know, early on that sometimes you sort of would leap before you thought it through. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering, so as you're talking about the facets, I, I'm sort of thinking about this idea that you're a boss taps you on the shoulder and says, Laura, what I really think you should do is this job. And you, you naturally, because maybe that is your personality, you'll say yes, even though you feel like maybe I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I'm wondering, do you think if you're presented with that kind of thing, how you can bring that to your whole explanation of like your strengths and your weaknesses or the facets of the yeah. diamond? When do you say, look, I don't think that's in my wheelhouse? Yeah. Or do you say, eh, I'll figure it out? Well, I think part of that leaping is also sometimes leaping to the nose too. Like something doesn't feel right. And I'm like, no. That's just not, you know, even if everyone else is sort of like, you know, like the decision to to go to Harvard, there was 90 percent of people were saying, don't go. Why really? Was, yeah. They said, why would you trade in your Bentley for a for I don't know, whatever fancy car. Lamborghini. They're, Lamborghini. they're like, they're, they're both fancy cars. Why would you trade in this to go? You're you're really also, stable. You know, people you're you've developed these networks. You've already gotten sort of to some extent that edge or that advantage. Why would you go and start all over? So, but there's there's these so sometimes the the leaping is just saying no, it doesn't feel right, and sometimes the leaping is let me go for it. But I think what's critical in there to sort of answer the how do you make sense of it is you learn and you really understand the facets of your diamond, or you understand your basic goods when you also have an ability to have humility and embarrass yourself. I've just been so embarrassed in so many different instances and you have to have a thick skin in that sense because that's where you learn and sometimes people learn after one time sometimes people learn when they see multiple instances where they've made the same mistakes and I'm a little dense sometimes it takes me two or three times of being embarrassed in the same way until I get it And when you're able to sort of do that, I feel like that's when you start to learn really who you are and the ways in which you can enrich and and provide value. I love this part of the book where you said, take your time going from inexperienced to pro. Take the time to master the basics, your own, not those of everyone around you. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it takes time. We're in such a rush to to become this person that we see or a mentor or some aspirational sort of thing. Someone once said to me, you should never be envious of someone else unless you're willing to trade entire lives and entire experiences with them. Meaning like we tend to have take one aspect of somebody and say, Oh, look how successful they are in their career. But in order to be envious or to want that in the same way or to be jealous of that person in that way, we have to understand, we have to be willing to assume their personality and their traits and their family and their all of those things that they've had to endure and go through as well. And when we, when we think about it that way, it makes it, at least for me, I've been able to be much more at peace with who I am in my own journey and to take my time in my own journey. I love the part about we, you sort of go from academic to like very blunt writing. And I loved that. So and, and what you do is you translate it. So I think it's so funny. You're talking about framing and identifying symptoms and formulating problems. And you're like, OK, to translate that, 
don't make your effing problem my effing problem. Now, yeah. can you talk about that? Because that jumped out at me and I just started <laughs> laughing out loud. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times because we're in this socially interconnected interpersonal world, not only do we sort of assume the identities of other people and their goals and all of those things, when there's something urgent or when there's something important or when there's a problem, you know, it gets passed off and it bleeds into all of the other lives of that person person. And so this friend of, of mine, Stan Von Bray, once said, you know, to one of his colleagues, don't make your effing problem my effing problem. And he used more colorful language than that. But Good. for the purposes of my audience in the book, I, I toned it down a little bit. But it's so true. And so I remember that sometimes when I when there's something when people are coming at me with with urgency or when people are coming at me with their sort of things, um, just to remember that their journey doesn't have to be your journey. Mm -hmm. What they care about, some of it will interact with what you care about, but it doesn't have to be that. And just because somebody took one trajectory to get to a place where you want to go doesn't mean you can't get to that exact same place with a different trajectory. Right. I mean, there are times where people will say to me, I find it interesting. They're like, you know, how do I become a financial journalist? I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I didn't do it the way that you would do it. Right. So there are a lot of different ways to get there. Right. But like, I wouldn't say that somebody should sort of aspire to have my zigzag weirdo crazy yeah. ass career, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering, you have been involved with efforts around diversity. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you do say very bluntly that stereotypes always invade our interactions. So can you talk about how we can better manage that? They do. I mean, from an academic side standpoint, stereotypes are a reality and they're actually useful to us because we cognitively can't process all of the information coming to us at the same time. And so from everything from the cereal brands that we like to the foods that we eat, to the interactions that we have with people, to the places we've been, we use stereotypes we cluster we do we do things to kind of give ourselves shortcuts so that we can manage all of this complexity and uncertainty that we're dealing with on an everyday sort of world but at the same time that creates these negative stereotypes as well. We, we tend to then cluster people and make generalizations as well. And so it's important to kind of understand that from each individual standpoint that those stereotypes come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. They don't have zero credence, but they also don't have 100% credence in any situation. And so that's the importance of what I talk about is stopping and redirecting that you need to be able to guide these perceptions of who you are, understanding that people are going to have these stereotypes of you. When you're able to understand not only who you are and who you are based on your background and your experiences, but also start to have this intuition about who your counterpart is and the background that they have and the experiences that they have, and in turn, how they might be perceiving you vis-a-vis -vis this interaction, that's when you have this power to flip stereotypes around and create your own advantage. Flip it in your favor. You're able to sort of stop and recognize that they might be seeing you in one way and then redirect. So a classic example of this is some that I've seen in, in multiple studies that I've run and in multiple people that I've had conversations with and heard their stories. It definitely applies to women and minorities. and But I've also seen this with people who have accents. And people who have accents are something that's considered a non-traditional American accent. We often think that it's about communication, that they're not able to communicate as well. But in fact, it's not about communication. It's about things like we, we deem them to be less interpersonally skilled, less likely likable, less likely to be a team player, all of those sorts of things. And so when you recognize that, when I've had people who have accents go into a job interview, for example, and recognize that they might be seen as someone who is less interpersonally skilled, less willing to work on a team. And then they get asked those typical interview questions, right? Like, tell me about a time when, and then they say things like, they give examples that, that tell the interviewer about a time where they fought for resources for their team. And they didn't stop until they met the goal and made that sale. They are addressing those very concerns that have to deal with interpersonal influence in a very benign way. Right. Not going like, I know what you're yes. seeing in me. Right. Yeah. I get that. Right. It's not like you you see you see that I'm a woman. And so then you assume that I'm not going to. Instead, you take those assumptions and you're addressing those assumptions by giving them examples that show them, 
wow, this person is very interpersonally influential. Oh, doesn't it? Isn't it maddening a tiny bit, though? I know it's it's the truth. <laughs> yeah. And so you want to be effective. And I know that's why you wrote the book. But there's a maddening part to this. Uh, I have a friend who is from the South. And when she got to her white shoe law firm, you know, three decades ago, uh, they sent her to elocution school. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. like they had a little program for people who didn't sound like white dudes from the Northeast, yeah, essentially. Yeah. And everybody went, it was like a boot camp of like sanitizing your accent. Right. Isn't I that mean, amazing? It is It is amazing. And it is infuriating in some instances. And, and not all accents work the same. I mean, for example, we found that British accents, people who have a British accent in particular are seen as more educated, yeah. more witty, more intelligent. Yeah, they're not um, thinking, oh, you're Eliza Doolittle selling right. flowers <laughs> in Covent right. Garden. They're like, that's oh, right. you went to Oxford. That's right. That's right. But, you know, it is infuriating. And it's infuriating because we know that there is, at some point we recognize that there is this myth of meritocracy, that we're being sold on this meritocracy, but it's really this myth. The structural sort of changes that we know need to happen may be happening or they may be happening too slowly or maybe they're happening but not in the ways that we anticipated. Mm. And so even though it is really sort of depressing, we still need to be able to have the tools to empower ourselves from the inside out as well so that we can operate within these imperfect systems because otherwise we do become bitter. Right. And we and don't jaded. want to do that. And, you know, and you could become me bitter and jaded. Well, and yet you're so nice. <laughs> no, you know, there is definitely a part of me that is bitter and jaded. But what I try and do is also flip that around. I think, is this making me bitter or is this making me better? Hmm, Take like your bitterness that. and let it make you better. OK, we started the interview and I said best career or financial decision. Yeah. You said it was being able to leap before you actually think it through. What's your worst Oh, I think the worst is making decisions for somebody else and thinking that they were for me. Mm. Um, And it's tough because we have lots of responsibilities. And one one reality of our world is that we um, we have responsibilities. We can't always say yes to things. We can't always say no to things. I am someone where one of the things that I value the most, one of the traits I value most in someone is loyalty. This like loyalty and being noble and, and giving back and paying it forward and those sorts of things. And that becomes a double-edged sword sometimes mm. because – I'm loyal to the point where I will do things even when, you know, they might not be right for me. And so I don't know that it's completely a wrong decision. I don't know that I would ever redo them, but they haven't completely worked out in my favor, I should say. You're listening to Jill on Money. Okay, it's time for the Marcus Minute. We are presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs in the hot seat today. Laura Huang, the author of Edge, Turning Adversity into Advantage. I've never had a Harvard Business School professor actually do this. So you ready? I'm your first. You are my first. I'm a virgin HBS. (laughs) Here we go. Ready? What's one word to describe your relationship with money? Complicated. What's always worth spending on? Your family. What's the dumbest thing you've spent money on? Jewelry. How much do you spend on a haircut? <laughs> um, $20. I get my haircut in Taiwan where <laughs> things are <laughs> much more affordable. Okay. It's your last day on earth. You've got a $100 in your pocket. What is your last meal? Um, roasted goose on top of rice with bamboo. That is so specific, and I love it. Thank you so much, Laura Huang, the author of Edge, Turning Adversity into Advantage. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks to Laura Huang. It was so great to meet her. If you have suggestions for great guests that we should consider, send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We drop new episodes of the program every Tuesday and Thursday. Sometimes we throw a bonus in, depending on the news cycle. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman, Mark Talercio, best executive producer in the whole world. We're distributed by Cadence 13, and our show is presented by Marcus by Goldman Sachs. See you next week.